Chapter Twelve of the World's Lumber Room by Selina Gay. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twelve: Vegetable Refuse. Various are the fates of the vegetable scavengers when, their time of active service in that capacity being over, they themselves fall under the head of refuse and pass into the lumber room to be remodelled. Both at the Cape and in Australia, bushes near the shore are often killed by the calcareous sand which buries them. As they decay, some of their carbon is converted into carbonic acid, which dissolves the lime immediately around them, and as evaporation proceeds, this is redeposited and forms a solid crust round the bark. When the decay is complete and all the wood converted into gases and ash, only a pipe of limestone remains, surrounded by loose sand, and often these pipes are filled with hard calcareous matter, which makes them so solid that when the sand shifts and they are left exposed, they look, especially when branched, like the white stony skeletons of the shrubs they represent. Sometimes vegetable substances are petrified, that is, as they decay and the various atoms of which they are composed are set free and return to the air, the place of each one is taken by an atom of something else, and if the process is allowed to go on, the whole may be converted into, or rather replaced by, a mineral or metal, which forms a model so exact that all the minute fibres and cells, and even the very texture of the original substance, are clearly distinguishable, though none of it remains. Pieces of petrified wood, in which the grain is distinctly visible, are found in large quantities in the Suffolk crag, but petrifaction or mineralisation is not the common fate of dead vegetable matter. When left freely exposed to the air, it is slowly oxidised or burnt up, the hydrocarbons, cellulose and starch of which, whatever its nature it chiefly consists, being converted into carbonic acid and water. The light-coloured fibres of the stems and leaves are gradually converted into a brown or black powdery substance, whose weight and bulk continually diminish as more and more carbonic acid and water are produced, and with a suitable temperature and full supply of air, the process goes on without interruption, though more and more slowly, until nearly all the carbon and hydrogen have returned to the air whence they came. The nitrogen, too, has been set free and gone back, partly as nitrogen, partly in combination with hydrogen as ammonia. In the island of Trinidad, where the heat is perpetual and rainfall large, all vegetable fibre decays so rapidly that, as Mr. Kingsley has said, there is hardly a dead stick or leaf to be seen, even in the primeval forest. An English wood, if left to itself, would be cumbered with fallen trees, and in North and South America there are forests in the temperate zones which are piled ten or fifteen feet high with dead or dying trunks in every stage of decomposition. But Trinidad is little more than ten degrees from the equator, and in that fierce heat fallen timber melts away in a few months or even days, and its gases, being rapidly absorbed by the luxuriant vegetation around, enter at once upon a fresh career. In temperate regions, on the other hand, the fallen leaves accumulate year after year, and so quickly that, although the first stage is rapidly passed through, and leaves, twigs and sticks are soon partially decayed, a fresh fall speedily follows, and as this, to a certain extent, excludes the air, the process is checked. It does not cease, but it proceeds more slowly, and whereas in Trinidad the soil, wherever visible, is just a yellow loam, undarkened by leaf mould, in an English wood there is often a foot or two of elastic, brown, peaty soil, and in the Himalayan forests this leaf and timber mould often accumulates to the depth of fifteen or twenty feet. In the Falkland Isles, where the climate is damp and cool, almost every kind of plant, even coarse grass, is converted into peat, which is sometimes twelve feet thick, and so compact that it will hardly burn. 
It is in the cypress swamps of America, however, that the formation of peat proceeds on the largest scale. The great dismal swamp of Virginia, which extends over a thousand square miles, is covered with many kinds of shrubs and trees, such as the white cedar or cypress, which like a watery situation, as well as with water plants without number and a multitude of ferns, reeds, etc., of all sizes up to eighteen feet, while the surface of the huge quagmire is in many places covered by a layer of moss four or five inches thick. The black spongy soil beneath is made by the decay of countless generations of these various forms of vegetable life, but it has advanced beyond what is strictly speaking the peat stage, for almost all trace of fibre has disappeared and the whole has been converted into mud, which again is dissolved and gives its colour to the clear brown-tinted water of the pools. The whole delta of the Mississippi, 14,000 square miles, is for the most part covered by a series of similar swamps and similar vegetation, growing with the utmost luxuriance, both in the water and in the black soil. In 1812, a large extent of cypress swamp in the Mississippi Valley was disturbed by earthquake and sank below the level of the water. Peat, ferns, tree stumps, fallen trunks and standing trunks being covered with the river mud or alluvium which is brought down in such abundance. In the course of time, the mud would so accumulate as to rise to the surface and would speedily be covered with a fresh growth. Another mass of peaty mud would accumulate on top of the old one with a layer of hardened mud or sand between. This alluvium being, however, more or less porous, would not prevent the buried peat from parting with more and more of its gases. But as the hydrogen, oxygen and nitrogen would pass away more rapidly than the carbon, the proportion of this latter would continually increase until there might be perhaps as much as 82% of carbon with 5.5% of hydrogen and scarcely 125 of oxygen and nitrogen together. The mineral composition of the mass would, in fact, be identical with that of coal, and much coal has evidently been formed in the manner just sketched, for we can see the soil in which the ancient trees and plants grew, as well as the soil heaped on their heads, and the trees themselves are often found standing upright and still rooted in the spot where once they flourished. Coal is found in the Manchester coal field at intervals through a thickness of 6,800 feet, 60 feet of which are workable coal. But the seams are separated by so many other deposits that the swamp, if swamp it was, must have undergone many such subsidences as that just described. Coal seams, however, appear more often to be the remains of dense jungles growing along the coast, such, perhaps, as the mangrove swamps of the present day. In the tropics, great quantities of trees and shrubs grow down not only to the very edge of the salt water, but actually in it. Many of the coal-bearing strata, accordingly, contain marine shells, and there are, in Russia, coal beds which alternate with limestone, showing that they must have been buried in the sea. During the coal period, when the best coal and all our English coal was formed, the climate greatly differed from what it is now, and tropical plants flourished all over the world. Vegetation was far more luxuriant, and its character was very different, for the English jungles were filled chiefly with ferns, reeds, horsetails, club mosses, of gigantic size but with no solid trunks, and, indeed, there was but little wood properly so called, in these old forests. Another change, too, has taken place since man came upon the scene, for the river banks are now covered with grass, corn, etc., which are carefully harvested, whereas when the greater part of the land was clothed with a rank vegetation which was left to grow and decay as it would, every little brook and stream would be loaded with dead leaves, and in time of flood would tear up and carry away many a tree. The state of things must indeed have been somewhat similar to that now existing in the vast unbroken forests through which flow the mighty Amazons and its tributaries. 
the rio negro and many other large tributaries are quite brown or even black like bog water from the dissolved vegetable matter which they contain while the little brooks are half choked with dead leaves rotten branches etc and when during time of flood the great river rises forty or fifty feet the largest forest trees are uprooted and hurried away enormous quantities of driftwood are also carried into the gulf of mexico some of the trunks having travelled a thousand miles down the mississippi no doubt also large matted masses of plants tree ferns etc were carried down by the rivers or washed away from the low jungle edge of tropical islands and either accumulated in estuaries or were thrown up on the swampy shore or carried farther out to sea but wherever they accumulated at the bottom of sea lake or swamp there if the conditions were favourable they would be converted into coal the same may be said of seaweeds for though no beds except some small ones in iceland can actually be proved to be formed of them yet seaweeds as well as shells are found fossil in coal and there is every reason to believe that they have contributed to its formation for we know that the ocean teemed with inhabitants which must have been fed as at the present day there is one plant however which has contributed so largely to the making of english coal that a few words must be devoted to it this is the common ground pine or club moss now an insignificant little plant only a few inches or at most two or three feet high the stems of which are covered with little scale-like leaves and terminate in spikes resembling fir cones between the leaves of the spikes are small round bags filled with fine dust like the pollen on the anthers of flowers which consists of spores and is so resinous and inflammable that it has been used in the preparation of fireworks a pinch of this lycopodium powder burns in a candle with an instant flash and being not readily affected by water is used by chemists for coating pills in the coal age there flourished giant relations of the little club moss forest trees in fact some of them a hundred feet high which might easily have been mistaken for pine trees their cones or rather catkins did not however produce seeds but the leaves composing them bore on their surfaces little sacks or cases scarcely larger than those of the present club moss and like them filled with spores a thin slice of coal under the microscope is seen to contain multitudes of yellowish-brown bodies about the twentieth part of an inch in diameter which are flattened bags often filled with irregularly rounded hollow bodies measuring about one seven hundredth part of an inch across these are the spores and their cases which form by far the larger part of all the english bituminous coal examined by professor huxley and contribute mainly to its inflammable character clouds of yellow dust may be shaken from a branch of club moss and on the shores of some of the canadian lakes there are often great heaps of yellow pollen which has been blown from the pine forests and being too light to sink has been thrown up on the muddy shore by the waves if this should ever be consolidated it would form with the mud a sort of shale very similar to an ancient deposit on the shore of lake huron which is so full of spores and cases that it burns readily with a bright flame there are innumerable seed-like bodies in the curious white coal as it is called though really it is brown now forming in australia which has all the character of true coal though of inferior quality owing to the clay and sand mixed with it the combustible portion consists entirely of spores as is the case also with the tasmanite of north tasmania which forms a stratum several feet thick and some miles in extent and has a granular appearance owing to the multitude of little round bodies it contains the black shales of ohio again which are more ancient than the coal age contain a considerable percentage of organic matter made up entirely of spores and cases the coal of borneo on the other hand is a much younger deposit than any english coal and of quite a different origin being formed from a mass of huge timber half of which still shows the grain of the wood. 
Old timber left in a mine in the Hearts, which is some 400 years old, has been found converted into brown coal or lignite, an earthy-looking lustreless substance of which large deposits are found in many parts of the world, especially in Hungary. Brown coal is far more ancient than this Hearts mine timber, but is modern compared with true coal, and contains a smaller percentage of carbon. But as it continues to give off gases, there seems no reason why it should not turn into true coal at last. Even then it will not cease to give off gases, two of which are often fatal to the miner, one being the deadly choke damp, or carbonic acid, which collects in old and ill-ventilated mines, and the other fire damp, a compound of carbon and hydrogen which ignites with violent explosion on the introduction of a light and the admission of a certain proportion of air. Coal varies extremely according to the amount of gas it contains, and when at last little is left but carbon and ash, it is called anthracite, which is so hard as not to soil the fingers, and burns with a dull, red, flameless and smokeless glow, giving out great heat. In the Wall's End colliery, so much inflammable gas escapes from the coal that on the insertion of a tin pipe in a hole drilled for the purpose and surrounded with clay, the gas issuing from the pipe may be lighted just as at an ordinary gas jet. It is by heating coal in large closed retorts that the gas we burn is obtained, and the same thing may be done on a small scale by filling the bowl of a tobacco pipe with coal dust covering it close with clay and holding it in the fire. Enough gas will be driven up the stem of the pipe to burn when a light is applied. Nature has in some cases used probably heat and certainly pressure to drive off the gas from large masses of coal, for in the Appalachian coal field which covers at least 63,000 square miles, according to Professor Bischoff, the coal passes into anthracite where the strata have been most disturbed by earthquake, and one remarkable bed, now fifty feet thick, is computed to have been probably two or three hundred feet thick before it was thus compressed. And now to consider some of the other metamorphoses undergone by dead vegetable matter. Landing on the point of La Bray in the island of Trinidad, we see that the beach is black with pitch, and that the so-called rocks or reefs consist also of pitch. One of the rocks, indeed, has been almost dug away to make asphalt pavement in New York and Paris. The pebbles on the shore are of the same substance, and everywhere there is pitch, no more than a foot or two beneath the surface which is constantly oozing through the brown soil, itself half pitch, in which the pineapples for which La Bray is famous grow to especial perfection. A pitch road leads up to the famous Pitch Lake, a mile and a half in circumference, which glares and glitters in the sunlight, and has something the appearance of a bed of gigantic black mushrooms of all shapes and sizes, from ten to fifty feet across, their round heads pressed close together, and the spaces between filled with water. In one part of the lake the pitch is constantly oozing up from the depths below, and is quite liquid, and the ground everywhere in the vicinity is full of pitch and coal-like matter to the depth of hundreds of feet. Beneath the lake there is said to be a bed of coal, and it is this coaly matter, as it seems, which is constantly turning into pitch and oil, which are forced up through every crack by the enormous weight of shale and sandstone above. The pitch is everywhere hardened into asphalt from the evaporation of the oil, except in the centre, and its highest temperature does not exceed 35 degrees centigrade, 95 degrees Fahrenheit. There is no evidence of any volcanic eruption close to the lake, but there is an active mud volcano twenty miles off, and the mainland is often shaken by severe earthquakes, so that in all likelihood the pitch is derived from beds of vegetable matter which are being slowly distilled by volcanic heat. A mile or two off there are beds of brown coal, one of which, if continuous, 
would pass beneath the lake at a great depth. And when it is considered that for ages past the Orinoco has been rolling down vast quantities of timber and vegetable matter, it seems highly probable that these are the materials from which the pitch is made. It is certainly derived from decayed vegetable matter, and sticks which drop into the liquid pitch are often found partially transformed into the same substance. Another product of the decomposition of vegetable matter is rock oil or petroleum, which is found in many parts of the world. Bituminous shales, i.e. hardened mud impregnated with vegetable matter, are also made to yield oil and thus, thanks to the way in which we have learnt to utilise nature's refuse, estates formerly worth but a few hundred pounds a year now bring in as many thousands. There are about a hundred petroleum wells in Burma, and there is one in Zanti which has been flowing for two thousand years. But petroleum was not discovered in America and Canada until 1861 in which year it was mentioned as an important fact that 250 barrels were exported. And important it undoubtedly was, for by 1882 the exports of petroleum from New York and Philadelphia had considerably exceeded 500 million gallons a year. It is not improbable, however, that the petroleum of North America may be in part of animal origin. American oil has been exported to all parts of the world and until recently held almost exclusive possession of the European markets. But now that the still vaster quantities about Baku on the Caspian and throughout the whole region north of the Caucasus are being explored and systematically worked, the American oil seems likely to be in a measure at least superseded. But whether we burn coal, rock oil, gas, or any of the various kinds of candles, our rooms are warmed and lighted by the heat and light drawn from the sun by trees, ferns, mosses, etc., ages ago. The carbon taken from the air is sent back in the form of carbonic acid, and in one way or another all that was drawn from the air is sent back to it to feed new generations. There are a few other forms of vegetable refuse, however, which we must not quite pass over. At one time it was believed that the diamond, the hardest of all known bodies, was simply a vegetable gum, for it consists of pure carbon with a trace of ash, and its value therefore arises not from its composition, but from the form in which it crystallises. Very minute but real diamonds have been artificially obtained from a gas containing carbon and hydrogen, the carbon being induced to crystallise by a method which need not here be described. These diamonds are therefore of vegetable origin, but we are entirely ignorant as to the way in which diamonds are formed in nature. Carbon crystallises in yet another and totally different form, namely in black opaque six-sided plates when it is called graphite, plumbago or black lead. This may very well be derived from the decay of vegetable matter, and jet is considered to be a highly bituminized wood which from the fact that it is often found surrounding fossils etc. seems to have hardened from a plastic if not liquid condition. The rocks in which it is found are often strongly impregnated with petroleum. Amber is the resin of some extinct species of pine, and is often found with coal or fossil wood. Many pines and firs at the present day have resin between their annual rings, and large masses of gum are found at the roots of the New Zealand kauri pine and exported to the amount of several thousand tonnes every year for the manufacture of varnish. Similar lumps are found at the foot of the Brazilian copal tree. It may not at first sight be obvious what connection iron pyrites has with vegetable refuse, but being a compound of iron and sulphur, both of which enter into the composition of plants, it may clearly be derived from them. 
The ash of beech wood, for instance, contains enough sulfuric acid and peroxide of iron to form pyrites to the amount of one forty-eight thousand and seventy-seventh part of the weight of the wood, and twenty-three times as much as this might be made if, during its decomposition, it should come in contact with water containing sulfuric acid. Many seaweeds contain a much larger proportion of sulfuric acid than this, and if, instead of escaping into the air, it were to come in contact with peroxide of iron, pyrites might well be formed. The sulphur contained in the seaweed thrown up every year near Helsingur is enough to make 332,000 pounds of pyrites. Probably, therefore, the large quantities of pyrites found in chalk are derived from seaweeds, and this, too, is likely to be the origin of the small percentage contained both in the blue limestone of the Jura, to which it is said to owe its colour, and in the bluish marl constantly deposited on the coast of Saint-Malo. End of chapter 12